Thank you, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Move this up, down. All right, fantastic. So, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Robert Wood. I work with Sigital. Uh, we're primarily a security consulting firm. We specialize in software security, uh, for those that know, know us. Um, this is me, in a nutshell. So, I run our Red Team Assessment Practice. Oh, no worries. You good? All right, stand by. You're set. All right. Um, so, I run our Red Team Assessment Practice at Sigital. Um, I've done all sorts of crazy things, as I'm sure uh, everyone in this room has. I'm going to work on software assessments, network stuff, you know, broken into buildings run social engineering stuff, work on mobile uh, security architecture things, uh, help build out security programs, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's really all of that types of experience and uh, consulting that has kind of led me into uh, developing this, this approach that, uh, that we're going to talk about today. So our agenda, uh, high level, we're going to talk about, you know, what is red teaming in, in our perception and how I would kind of hopefully urge all of you to, to think about red teaming, uh, what the currently what the current industry standard approach is, um, you know, why that is flawed in a few cases and you know where we can improve it. Um, and a, a part of that is a reliance and over reliance on point in time risk uh, scenarios when you're conducting assessments. Um, elements of building up a successful red team, whether you're a company and you, you're trying to bring in a vendor to do a red team, you know, what you want to look for to make that to make that successful so you're not just dropping money down the toilet, or if you're standing one up internally, the kinds of skills that you're, uh, that you're going to want to bring together. Um, bringing software into the mix. So, you know, as I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, in a lot of cases, software is what's actually handling a lot of our assets. Um, so our bank account information, our health records, all of that stuff. And if we completely neglect that, that application layer, then we're not testing and evaluating the security posture of you know, ultimately what's handling our, our most sensitive stuff. And we're going to talk about the, the concept of continuous red teaming, which is kind of a, it's still in a, a very rough brainstorm uh, concept right now, but we've just started developing a, a framework or platform uh, to conduct red teams on a continuous, uh, on a continuous basis, uh, much in the same way that you have, uh, you know, network assessments continually running have folks like Veracode continually running binary scans, things like that. Um, so we're going to talk about our idea for that and you know, why it might be helpful. So moving right into things, um, so does anyone here, uh, and feel free to just raise your hand real quick, does anyone uh, have any experience with red teams, ever done a red team? Awesome, awesome. So uh, real quick, I'll, uh, just one person who raised their hand, um, you know, can you tell me what, uh, in like 30 seconds or less, what uh, the capacity uh, you played on your red team was? We have the course of a week to break in and do whatever we can, kind of show the impact of real world threats. Uh, the scope was wireless application, network perimeter, physical, uh, and that for week we really open source. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, so for anyone who missed the beginning of that, it was essentially uh, it was a time box assessment, uh, real world adversary emulation, uh, open scope type of scenario where uh, you know you're driven by something, you know some kind of attacker motivation, and you're just going uh, you know, throw the kitchen sink at whatever your target is and attempt to accomplish it. Um, so, how is red teaming different from any other kind of just pen test? Um, so. A lot of pen tests, as I'm sure you guys know, end up just being a very boiled down bug list. So we're looking at a target, whether it's a network infrastructure, a web app, a mobile app, something, and it, it turns out just to be a bug list. So we're trying to find everything that is wrong with whatever our target is, whether it's acnebank.com, whether it's acnebank's network infrastructure, whether it's uh, some shiny new mobile app they just put on the iOS or Android store. Whatever, whatever the case may be, we're just trying to find as much wrong with that, that thing as we can. So red teaming on the flip side is a goal-based adversarial testing process. Um, red teaming in, as a term developed way, way back when um, uh, 
back in, uh, it had its roots in like military war game scenarios. So, you know, generals and commanders, all of these guys would use it to, you know, they would lay out a military strategy of attacking something or, you know, accomplishing some goal, whether it's transport goods from A to B, whether it's take down some enemy that's hiding over there. And essentially they would put this up on a big board um, and essentially play out a chess like match where they would say, we're going to do this. We know our adversary or we think our adversary might respond this way. What are we going to do after that? And it's, it's K-level thinking where you're trying to think, uh, you know, several steps out in advance. Um, so that translated all the way into, uh, into you know, our information security world and pen testing, where now we have these, these goal-driven uh, adversarial testing processes. So we're thinking about everything in terms of how, our, how an actual adversary is going to do it. We're going to emulate an adversary. Um, in most cases, uh, we try to push our customers into doing this as an organizational assessment as opposed to testing a very specific target in a very specific setting. So, you know, testing AcmeBank.com in UAT under, you know, tightly monitored conditions, all that stuff. It's not, you can kind of extrapolate the findings that you get in that scenario to real world situations, but it's not a real world situation at the end of the day. Um, another big thing is we're going to be able to measure how an organization, so I'll, I'll keep using Acme Bank um, just to protect all the banks that I actually work with. Um, to measure how Acme Bank responds to a real world attack, or at least a simulated one in this case. So we're because we're going to be using the exact same attack uh, attack techniques, we're going to be driven by the same goals that an attacker is going to be driven by. Uh, we'll see if if Acme Bank or whatever client can detect whatever attacks we're doing, and subsequently how they respond to those attacks. Do they lock us out? Do they just remove the asset from uh, from existence, or you know? You know, there are a number of things you could do to respond, but we want to we want to see if we can quantify that. Um, we're also going to be able to incorporate a lot of different components of an organization. So components have they have networks, they have apps, they have buildings, they have people supporting all that stuff. They have business processes supporting different components of their business. Uh, so we're going to get to evaluate all those different things, or at least we're going to consider all those different things when we're going after our target. So. I like this little graphic um, in describing how a red team assessment relates to other security assessment services. Um, so essentially, uh, consider this, uh, consider all of these silos as any one given type of security assessment. So you know, we could do a, a test on an embedded uh, or thick client technology, we could uh, do a mobile app test, we could do a wireless network test, and you can do everything from the very basic assessments where it's more or less just automated tools, scan, generate XML, form XML into your own report and deliver it into whoever's going to consume. And you can do very, very advanced assessments where you, you do that stuff and you do a little bit more and a little bit more and it's a very, very manual process and you, know, you really dive deep into whatever your target is here. I like to think of a red team assessment as sitting on top of all these things driven by a goal. So wherever you are uh, in relation to accomplishing your goal. So, you know, you lay out an attack path where, you know, your goal is over here and accomplishing the goal is over here and all the steps along the way of getting to that attack path. Um, you may use any one of these techniques, and this is not an all-inclusive uh, graph, I just, you know, ran out of screen real estate. Um, but you may use any one of these techniques to accomplish your accomplish your goal. So uh, don't think of it in terms of it has to be a network pen. It has to include network testing. It has to include app testing or social engineering, whatever the case may be. It's likely that you may go in one direction or another, but it doesn't have to. It, you're not restricted. To that. And so uh, some basic elements of a red team. Anyone who's uh, you know watched a talk on red teaming or gone to YouTube and, and saw a talk there, uh, you've probably seen the very basic Venn diagram of electronic, social, physical. Um, I splashed up the little recon and more because, you know, personally I think there's there's a little bit more that we can do than just uh, considering the electronic, social, physical aspects and just doing bug hunts. You're essentially just doing a wider bug hunt if you just consider those components. Um, so really quickly, the electronic space, you know, it's, it's software, it's network, it's wireless. Uh, all the stuff that we would expect it to be. Uh, social, this is where you get um, you know, the human element into things. So you have attacks like phishing coming into play. 
uh, you know, you're calling up somebody on the phone and you know, trying to get them to divulge some confidential company information or uh, password or something like that. Um, I am or chat functionality and of course the foolish stuff that you know we know a lot of people put out on social media, so their Facebook accounts and LinkedIn, all that good stuff. Um, so physical. Uh, this is where you get into access control technology, so all the badges that we're using to get into our buildings, the locks that we use to secure our more sensitive stuff, um, you know, guard, uh, guard duties. So, you know, if you outsource your, your guards or you have a shared facility, uh, do you even have this, uh, physical facility security? Uh, or do you, do you rely on police and something you get suspicious? Uh, also, all of the, the processes that go into obtaining access badges. Uh, and of course, none of these lists are all inclusive probably add to them uh, you know, until the end of time. But you know, how do, how do people get access badges? Uh, if somebody forgets their access badge for a day, what do they do then? You know, do they just not come to work for that day? Or, you know, all things to consider. Um, so some of the other activities. Uh, you know, any good red team is usually, any, any good assessment really, but, but primarily red teams are driven and kind of glued together by the reconnaissance that you do in those, in those uh, situations. So, Usually they always start with, with some element of reconnaissance and you're always gathering and learning more information about your target. And as you go throughout, you're kind of piecing all that together and that's like the glue to your insider assessment. Um, business processes. So I mentioned before, uh, you know, a lot of customers, not just customers, but any, any business has certain processes that they use to support you know, things or you know, processes within their organization. So maybe it's uh, new employee onboarding. Um, so how does that process look from a workflow perspective? Uh, is it all handled by technology? Is there a lot of people intervention? Uh, passive resets for customers versus employees uh, for remote access. You know, is it all handled through, you know, I submit my, my email address through some online form and get some one-time uh, token email to me, or can I call up the CSR and try to convince them to reset my password? Uh, so understanding how those things work and the various avenues you can accomplish them may lead you down the road of, you know, missing or weak controls in one route versus another. Um, gathering some element, or doing some element of threat intelligence and threat modeling. So this is really where we're emulating a very specific adversary or uh, a category of adversaries. So if we have, um, if, we, if we're working with defense, uh, defense contractors or government contract, or uh, government agencies in some cases, uh, we may be considering, you know, not just the script kitty uh, type of threat, but maybe uh, you know the organized nation state or the organized crime uh, threat actor. We're going to have much more enhanced capabilities and obviously very different adversarial objectives. Um, incident response capabilities. We touched on that just a little bit ago. Um, so, how does an organization respond to any given type of attack? Um, can they detect it? And how do they respond? And of course, risk management. Uh, I'm going to talk about risk management in a little bit different context than you may be used to. But it's essentially flipping how an organization does risk management um, on its side and using it against itself. So um, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a, in a composite attack uh, war story, I guess, uh, if you will. But essentially, so we'll use Acme Bank again as an organization. So acmebank.com, consider uh, you know any big bank, their primary flagship website is going to be at the very top of their risk ranking. Um, so it, it gets the most attention, the most money gets sunk into protecting it. Uh, you know, from a network app perspective, that's where all the money goes. But subdomains of acmebank.com may not get as, uh, nearly as much money in defense and uh, attention throughout the SDLC with regards to bug management, bug identification, and stuff like that. So you may be able to use those, um, those lower priority apps against the Acme Bank organization. Um, and role-based social engineering is a concept that we're, uh, that we're flushing out. And it's essentially, instead of targeting the point-in-time risk social engineering where you're emailing Joe Schmo in finance or Mary over in HR and trying to get them to divulge information, it's social engineering a role within the company. So this kind of ties into the business process analysis where we're going to social engineer a CSR as it fits into the password reset process. So are there weaknesses in that password reset flow that allow any given human who's, who fits in that role to be susceptible to social engineering? Or are there technical controls in place to help protect people from themselves? Because uh, ultimately, 
uh, you know, anyone could be susceptible, no matter how smart we all think we are, to social engineering at any given time. So if we have technical controls in place that allow us, or that, that prevent us from shooting ourselves in the foot, then that's going to be that's going to be better uh, for folks who may not be as well trained in the in the art of security and the you know the, the hacker dark arts, um, which our CSRs are not. So, uh, so ultimately, we want to help protect people. So tying all this together, uh, we're going to walk through a, a little composite attack scenario that uses a lot of these different things. Uh, so a while ago, we were working on a uh, defense contractor. Uh, so it was a full open scope engagement, several months long. So we really had uh, you know a lot of budget to work with, a lot of time to work with, and they were worried about you know terrorist organizations and organized crime with regards to their uh, their corporate ID. Um, so. From the, uh, from the perimeter, everything was very, very secure. Um, so we did a lot of different network testing, a lot of different app testing on anything we could find. Everything was pretty well locked down. Um, that all changed as soon as you actually showed up on their front, on their front step. Uh, so gaining, access, gaining physical access into their facility was pretty easy. Um, you know, we were able to tailgate, we you know, did a few different things, but ultimately where you were able to tailgate from, you had to, you had to do a lot more uh, you know, either like lift cards or clone cards or something to get further into the facilities. Uh, so what we ended up doing, and the reason uh, you know FedEx is up there, is we got FedEx uniforms. We got these big uh, you know Pelican cases that I'm sure you guys have seen. You know, it was probably like this big. You know, it was, it was pretty big. It was big enough to put somebody in. I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave with that. So we took it to a machine shop. Uh, we put you know dummy locks on the inside. Or dummy locks on the outside, real locks on the inside, so somebody could open it up and uh, see our guy hanging out in there. Uh, we got him a company uniform made up, um, put a little periscope on the top so he could see outside everything, um, and we showed up with uh, you know custom critical uh, FedEx van that we obtained, and uh, you know we showed up while the actual FedEx guy, the UPS guy, were there, and we had our little handheld. We wheeled the guy in, and. Uh, you know, they're like, oh, you know, custom critical box. You know, this is, this is fascinating. We've never ever received anything from custom critical. Uh, where are we going to put this thing? We're like, you know, I don't know. We don't know who the recipient is. Apparently, uh, we're our our instructions were you're getting a separate set of keys tomorrow to actually open up this thing, um, and that will have the recipient. They're so like, all right. You know, that doesn't seem suspicious. <laughs> so they brought him in. Uh, brought him in, passed everything, and that was passed. Uh, their storage room was actually up by all the executive offices where there was uh, the security was a lot more lax around that section of the office. So they put him in a storage room, uh, not locked or anything, and uh, you know went home for the day. So as soon as, uh, and this was towards the end of the day as well. So you know he waits 30 minutes. Our guy gets out of the gets out of the crate, and uh, he had a bunch of the poem plugs on him. As I'm sure you saw the poem plugs, you guys are probably all familiar with them. Um, had a bunch of poem plugs with him, and so he went into each of the executive offices, plugged them into uh, into their network jacks. They didn't have any kind of uh, you know MAC address filtering, anything like that. So we were able to have our team, who was sitting on the parking lot, you know, now have shells on. We had like four or five shells on on their internal network at this point. Um, so that was fun. Uh, he got out. Nobody nobody caught him or anything because he was dressed as an employee. And of course, getting out of a building is a lot easier than getting in. So you know. He got out, you know, easy peasy. So a little bit of network scanning didn't really reveal too much for us. Um, you know, they they were locked down in a few cases, but we did identify one uh, one application that was it appeared to be homegrown, um, just based on how it looked. And so you know, we we decided we wanted to zero in on that. It had some kind of very um, it had some kind of name that was that kind of led us to believe that that was where they were housing a lot of their a lot of their sensitive stuff. Um, so of course we uh, we get on the login page and it's protected by username and password. Uh, so the first thing we try, of course, is username, admin, and uh, you know basic SQL injection string. And uh, of course it works. Uh, sweet. So we get in. It had all their you know it it was handling. It was a front end for all their uh, all their source code. It had all their uh, you know data analytics algorithms and stuff. All the stuff that you really would not have wanted to fall into the hands of their competitors. Uh, because they were kind of the leading, uh, the leading company in that space, and it also had, uh, based on how their company worked, they they embedded engineers in military and other government groups around the world, 
to help with data collection. Um, and so they also had all of those operational employees who were out working alongside you know, special forces units, helping collect information and stuff. They had the locations, names, dates, all, you know, all sorts of stuff stored in this application that we were able to access. Uh, so that was really bad. Um, that was a fun job. And uh, on that note, we are hiring. Um, <laughs> if anyone wants to uh, be shipped around in a FedEx box. Um, <laughs> so the existing industry approach, um, this is for anyone who's, you know, again, watched any kind of YouTube video, anything like that. Um, it's very rudimentary. A lot of it is just basic network pen testing, uh, maybe a little bit of social engineering with the, you know, with phishing, all that, uh, maybe some phone calls, maybe some physical pen testing. And by that, I mean, maybe they show up, maybe they try to get into your building by tailgating. Maybe they drop a few US, USBs with something on it. And then they, you know, maybe pop a few shells in some employees' boxes, and then they write your report and run away and uh, send you an invoice. And that's, that's pretty much the, the approach. Um, so I'm sure you guys see where this is going. It's flawed in a few different major ways. Um, as we mentioned before, a lot of stuff is taking place at the app layer. So if we're not doing anything at the app layer, all that stuff is completely neglected. So in the composite attack scenario we just discussed, you know, if we were just working on the network layer and physical pen testing, stuff like that, maybe we would have gotten in, maybe we would have gotten to the point where we got to that core app. But if we're not even considering application layer attacks, then you know, we would have fallen short of achieving our goal. Um, also, the reliance on very quick win techniques doesn't really tell us much about how it, how the organization, you know, Acme Bank, whatever they, the company is, you know, how, how their overall security posture really works. Um, and it also doesn't, of course, tell us how that organization responds to an attack. So if I'm launching one single uh, phishing attack on one single employee, or I'm doing just a couple of basic network scans and you know not really working with their incident response team, anything like that, then we don't really know if they're detecting us, how they're responding to us, things like that. Because ultimately, as consultants, we want to help our customers improve their security posture. We don't want to just you know make ourselves feel cool. Uh, that doesn't really help anyone, uh, except for our egos. Um, we also have no idea how, uh, so a lot of organizations will have anywhere from like one to several thousand applications in their, you know, in their portfolio. Uh, so this, this current approach doesn't really, it doesn't really tell us how all those things fit together uh, with regards to, you know, risk ranking where certain things may be vulnerable and, uh, and all that. So, uh, you know, this is a very basic point in time risk scenario. Um, again, just, I, I kind of alluded to this before, but a lot of it's just Targeted phishing attacks. Uh, you know, maybe I get access to a to a certain per, to a certain person's system. Maybe I don't. Um, even if I'm allowed pivoting, uh, it's usually it's usually all just at the network layer. Um, so it's only sometimes uh, interesting, depending on what I can get. And of course, with that point too, I also need to be able to uh, to exfiltrate data. So getting access to data is only half the battle. Um, figuring out how to exfiltrate it is a whole other thing because there's a lot of money that goes into not only protecting stuff, but protecting stuff after it's already been found. So, uh, so this this kind of short-sighted approach also doesn't tell us if that data. Yes, maybe I can get access to a system where it's stored, but did I, you know, break the encryption, or did I find the key that allowed me to decrypt the sensitive data to actually get that data out um, where it could be seen and used against the company? We don't know. So. Uh, some elements for success, so uh, going into success with red teaming, we need to scale, we need to expand, and we need to, uh, you know, obviously, hopefully secure things. So setting up a successful red team. Um, so I'm going to use threat model here. Um, you know, threat modeling in a lot of places means a lot of different things. Essentially, what I, need, what I mean by threat modeling in the context of red teaming is considering the adversary that you're trying to emulate. So whether it's the script kitty, which is just foolish, just do a normal pen test. Um, you don't want to emulate a script kitty in a red team, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but maybe it's, a, maybe it's a sophisticated criminal organization, maybe it's a nation state, maybe it's a malicious user or a malicious insider, something like that. Um, and different adversaries, different threat actors have very different objectives, very different capabilities, and essentially what you can do 
uh, or what we've started to do uh, as sort of a, a predictive tool is we'll do our threat analysis. So we have, you know, threat actor A, threat actor B, threat actor C. Each threat actor has their own set of goals, whether it's get access to customer data, whether it's bring this service down, whether it's uh, break in somewhere and just, you know, post something on the internet that I did something cool, whatever the case is. Each of these threat actors also has a set of capabilities. So, you know, whether it's money to spend, skills at their disposal, um, you know, the nerve to actually go break into a building, because somebody over, you know, a script kitty located over in Russia, or just a script kitty in general, may not have the nerve or the wherewithal to go and break into a facility. Um, so physical pen testing might be completely out of, you know, out of their element. They're just, they're not going to be involved in that kind of thing. It's all going to be remote attacks. Um, and essentially what we do with those is we map those in kind of a matrix format to actual technical and business risks that we identify in the, um, throughout the course of the engagement. And this is kind of produced as a, as a deliverable. So essentially what we have here is a set of antecedent conditions that we can use and say, this threat actor, they, they want to do this, they can do this, and these risks are real. We've identified them uh, that tie back into those. So this is a very likely attack path. Um, in your organization right now, uh, given all these things. Um, another thing you also want to do up front is, uh, you know, work with your client or work internally to identify what your business goals are, what your business risks to those goals are. Uh, so ultimately, if we're not tying everything back into the context of your organization, then the results are going to be much less helpful. Um, and with any risk that you identify throughout an assessment, whether it's a single cross-site scripting instance or, uh, you know, whether it's every single system that you scan on the network seems to be out of patch uh, or, you know, have an, older, have an older patch or an older version and it's always this version, you can kind of extrapolate those findings into bigger security themes across the organization. So, you know, if you, if you find these things consistently, whether it's, you know, missing framework for preventing against injection attacks or missing patch management system, stuff like that. You know, what is what is actually happening underneath that, that or on the back end of that? You know, do you guys not have a patch management system? And if it's happening here on these systems, is it also going to happen on that side of the organization where we didn't look? Um, but if it's if this process is just inherently flawed or missing, then it's probably, you know, you probably also have issues over here. So we can we can fix much broader problems or help our clients fix much broader problems in this case. Right. So, uh, so we kind of already discussed this very, uh, very briefly, so I won't really touch on any of this, um, but essentially, you know, I, I assume we're releasing these slides, so in case you guys want uh, just the content. So, uh, again, with business goals and risks, um, this is a this is an activity that's best done right up front, so that way you can actually use the business goals and risks to guide, uh, you know, to guide your attack path generation, guide your reconnaissance, guide. You know, if if your if your companies are very very worried about uh, securing, uh, you know, bank information, then as opposed to maintaining customer availability, then you're going to want to look for issues that relate to that, as opposed to you know, denial of service type issues, for instance. It all makes sense. Um, nothing revolutionary. So, uh, the software attack service. Uh, so again, as, I, as we mentioned before, software is actually what's handling a lot of our sensitive stuff. So whether it's, you know, interacting with acmebank.com and you've got, uh, you know, SQL queries and stuff actually retrieving and displaying the data that we're, uh, the bank account data that we're working with. Um, if we don't consider the application layer, then we're not going to be you know, that's, that's usually the easiest, the path of least resistance to the data, uh, to the sensitive data. And again, in a lot of big organizations, we've got application portfolios ranging from anywhere from like 110, you know, just a handful of apps. And I've seen places with over like 3,000 applications in the organization. So how do they manage that mess? Um, how do they secure it all? How do they know where assets lie? Uh, what applications are using those assets? In a lot of cases, they don't. They have no idea, um, and that is an that's an advantage for the adversary. Um, and again, just scanning the network, just doing network layer stuff, um, is not going to give you the big picture here. So doing both gets you a little bit closer, but just doing the network, unfortunately, it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's important, but it's not the complete. Uh, it's not the complete solution. So. 
so leading into the next uh, composite attack scenario, we'll talk about uh, real quickly about the high risk of low risk applications. So I alluded to a little while ago with AcneBank.com, the flagship application of Acne Bank, um, where they spend all their time and money depending. Uh, consider for a second, and this is actually a very real scenario, a subdomain of Acne Bank. Uh, let's call it promotions. So promotions.acnebank um, also has, uh, it uses all the same cookies, it uses all the same, uh, it has a same, uh, similar CSR backend that acnebank.com does. Um, but promotions.acnebank.com doesn't get any money in terms of security funding, uh, you know, bug management, any of that. It doesn't, it doesn't even go through a pen test before it gets pushed out on, uh, onto production. So, uh, if, you, if you think about, like, you know, attacks like cross-site scripting, for instance. Um, if I can find a cross-site scripting uh, instance on, which, you know, cross-site scripting is a very basic bug. It's very easy to find, it's very easy to exploit, it's very easy to create, very real-world payloads. Um, launching a phishing attack on a customer's actual domain, so not trying to redirect them to some some weird cop job URL that you went out to GoDaddy and bought, um, but launching those attacks on a customer's actual URL. Um, so all the things that we normally tell people to to watch out for when it, when they come to phishing uh, or when it comes to phishing attacks, you know, look at the URL, do this, do that. It doesn't apply in this case. So I can rewrite the entire page to include anything I want, which, as you'll see in this. Uh, in this next case, we actually did this. So, uh, so this was a red team for a for a very large uh, multinational financial institution, um, called Acme Bank, as usual. Um, and they had a, a marketing esque uh, application, uh, just as I described. They had, you know, they were using shared cookies, um, and none of those cookies they were it was all tied back into SSO. So they were all scoped to the parent domain. None of them were protected with HTTP only or secure or anything like that. Um, so we did a lot of reconnaissance. Uh, we found that you know their normal VPN required uh, uh, you know two-factor auth, so that was going to be a tough nut to crack. Um, they did have an admin VPN that was only uh, single factor, so it was just username and password, and it was all of course domain credentials. Um, we found a bunch of employee email addresses. Uh, coincidentally, also some of them admins. Uh, we found out on LinkedIn. Um, you know, jigsaw, stuff like that. So we did a lot of network testing, a lot of application testing, and we got to this, um, we got to this promotion site, and so we, we found cross-site scripting all over this thing, like pretty much every parameter that this thing used. Uh, so we put together a, an attack, and we sent it into our employees, redirected, or redirect, sent them, sent the attack to the targets, redirected them to this page, and so we, we put together this ruse. It was, you know, we're rolling out some bonus pilot. Uh, if you want to be a part of it, you know, you're going to have to give us your domain credentials, blah, blah, blah. Um, and of course, you'll get like a 25% bonus at the end of the quarter. Sweet. So a lot of people came into our site. Um, you know, at, at the time when they came into it, uh, we did a basic cross site scripting attack, posted all their cookies, which of course, some of those were the, uh, the internal. Uh, because it was all tied to SSO, it was, you know, Acne Bank, SSO, Cookie, you know, and then the value. So it posted those back, and then we presented them with a logon page to, to collect their domain credentials. So once we went through here, um, we went to that admin VPN, logged in with a few of the admin credentials that we obtained, and we found that in, in some cases there was separate authentication, um, but we could get into internal applications that also leveraged those, that same cookie. So since we had valid cookies from our cross-site scripting attack and VPN access, we had access to all these internal administrative applications that allowed us to transfer money, uh, get access to you know, customer bank account information. So it was a really bad situation for this uh, for this organization based on a couple of what would appear to be very minor flaws. So you know, if we were to just report cross-site scripting on promotions.acnebank.com to them, they wouldn't have cared. They would have never addressed it. Um, same with the cookie issue. You know, you can tell somebody a thousand times that yes, your cookies can be stolen by any domain on the on the or by any application on that uh, on that domain if they're scoped to the parent. Or yes, HTTP only is, is important. You know, they're not really going to care until they see something as eye popping as this. Um, so that's exactly what we did. Um, it was a bad day for them. 
So, <laughs> so continuous red teaming. So I'll fly through this really quick and then uh, leave it up to some questions for you guys. But essentially, um, why we want to why we want to try to push our way into this, uh, or you know, try to wrap our heads around doing this as a as a solution, is you know we have already in place we have a lot of network and application continuous scanning solutions, and it's really just you know running. Uh, you know, some tool against some target, you know, it's it's the targeted bug hunt type approach. Uh, just run on a continuous, uh, you know, cron job, whatever. Uh, just runs and runs and normalizes data, presents it to you in a nice little dashboard. Um, so essentially the idea uh, that we're wrestling with is rolling all of that up into, uh, into one single solution. So the network part, the application part, and then automating some element of open source reconnaissance. So there's there's a lot of frameworks out there that exist to to help with open open source reconnaissance, whether it's Maltego, whether it's uh, the Recon and G framework, and there's a few other uh, really really good ones that are extensible out there. Uh, using those to collect very similar types of data, normalizing that, and tying it back into the types of issues we're identifying here, um, is the first step. Uh, second step is you know evaluating all these risks over time. So you know how things change throughout an organization over uh, you know over the course of several weeks, several months, several years. Um, we can we can identify changes in an environment closer to real time as opposed to waiting for the next annual pen test to happen before you know even though they've gone through 18, 18 code pushes and network config changes uh, prior to that. Um, we can also. Uh, um, one of the big things here as well is uh, is looking at the entire portfolio or the entire organization with regards to this process. We can start to quantify the entire attack surface into one big picture. So we can look at the at issues like the shared cookies, the shared CSR functionality, things like that, and tie that back into you know we know that that this subset of your entire portfolio is using the same uh, the same components for whether it's authorization, authentication. Um, support things like that. Tie that all into this big picture, and we can, and we can kind of group applications into this uh, into a little bit more useful, at least from our perspective, risk rankings. Um, so that's that's our idea. Um, it's still, like I said, being very very much flushed out. We've we've just started design work and, and a little bit of coding on on some parts of it, but of course there's a lot that uh, that still needs to be uh, that still needs to be flushed out. But, I figured I'd uh, introduce it to you guys and let you uh, pull it over. So, uh, so thank you for your time. Um, you know, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, shoot me any questions, anything like that, I'm always happy to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, as I'm a security and technology junkie, so um, yep. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. And. Uh, Can you simulate an uh, incident attack? So, uh, so with regards to simulate, so the question was uh, simulating an insider attack. So it's really about uh, the capability. So with an insider attack, you have a certain, uh, you know, you have an initial capability of I have inside access. Um, the insider may have certain goals, whether it's to bring down, uh, bring down a customer uh, as a result of being pissed off or something if they're fired or. Um, or slighted up rates, something you know, think office space. Um, so they have certain uh, <laughs> right. So they have they have certain grudges against uh, an organization. So try to figure out what their what their objectives are. Their capability is they have that internal access. So it's really you would just, instead of starting from the external perspective, we start from the external perspective in most cases, just because that's. That's the threat actor that everyone is most concerned about is the you know the guy sitting over in Russia, the guy sitting over in China, or you know, wherever in the world coming after the organization. Because the perimeter is just it's very visible. It's very it's like the default setting for what I want to secure first. But here we would just start with that internal access. We would start with a base level employee account maybe, and then we would just go from there. So it's really about, you know, determining what the capabilities are and then uh, what your goals are and then starting your test. Will there be a 
So actually, uh, so I did a red team a while ago where uh, you know it was actually up to me to uh, to gain access as that employee. And uh, so I went in and I didn't even apply to the company or anything. I kind of just I, I tailgated in for like a week straight and just kind of told everyone else. I you know grabbed a cube. And uh, at the end of the week, I was actually like, I kicked somebody out of the, the cube that I was stealing. What are you? Get out of here. This is my cube. You see my name on the thing. Um, and so I was hanging out there, and you know, I was there for uh, like three to four months, and I was doing network testing and stuff every single day. You know, just kind of probing and finding new things. It was very low and slow. Uh, I did a lot of googling during that time because I didn't want to raise any alarms. You know. Um, so it's just a uh, very low and slow attack working on, uh, you know, working on getting access. I think it was, some, it was some element of customer data. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was a few years ago. Uh, but at the end of it, you know, I was, I was essentially an employee. Like I went down to the security office, had them give me a badge. Um, people were inviting me to pop up lunches. Like, um, so, you know, in, in that case, you know, the admins, uh, and a couple of the managers were the only ones that knew about me. Um, and so every, you know, they would see me in the hall and just shake their heads because they knew what I was really doing there. And, uh, you know, but they were, they were monitoring my activity and just not telling me about it. So you know, they, they could see that everyone was immediately trusting of me based on how I acted. And of course, they didn't have the network controls in place to detect anything I was doing, technical attack-wise. So. Yes? Can you give some examples of things that would trip up a red team? So, process-oriented things that would trip up a red team. Uh, it's usually very, very needy clients, um, or very just needy managers that want to have insight into every little thing that's going on. Um, that's oftentimes what we want to, what we run into. Or it's like you know, you can only attack during these these windows, or you have to tell us every single time before you can do something. Uh, actually, the question is, um, what kind of things did you run into that? cause the red team to fail? So, I'm not sure that I've actually ever had a red team that has just ultimately failed. Um, Run into a system that's totally encrypted, you can't. So, so in those, in, I mean, you run into a situation, there's always there's always another way. So, you know, in, in most red team situations, like if you, like if I run into a, if I run into a lock, for instance, it's very, like I, I don't know how to pick it, or something like that, I'm just gonna, you know, as an attacker would do, instead of focusing all my time on that, um, especially in the case of the consulting engagement time boxed scenario, I'm just going to go find another way in, or I'm going to talk somebody into breaking it for me, uh, whether it's an admin or like unlocking it or something like that. So, I'd say a funny point. I mean, something that from the outside I'm attacking as a red team member, and yeah. I see something that looks like low hanging. Well, you're just wasting a bunch of time now to find a great system these bots that's been put there on purpose to waste my time. It's time box 40 hours. I'm not wasting a day on it. That's that's okay. Yeah, so I mean I guess in the context of the consulting engagement, um, you know, time is your biggest enemy. Um, like, you know, you mentioned with your red team you had a week. Um, which a week is just I mean a week is crazy. If you have enough guys and it's open scope, a week's plenty of time to get it. A week is plenty of time to get in, but if you so any time that you lose is very valuable. So if you lose a day, then it's twenty percent of your engagement out the window. Um, well, you know, less than that if you're going to work on the weekends. But we'll say twenty percent, um, assuming we're off, not all workaholics. And uh, so yeah, I mean, time is time is your biggest enemy. But you know, it's usually like things aren't usually showstoppers. They're usually just obstacles that you know you run into, and then you just find another way around once you. That's that's usually been my experience. I guess. What about honeypot? Do you ever been in the situation when the admin? Yeah, so I I for you and yeah, so I've I've run into honeypots before, and it's uh, you can usually you can usually figure them out if they're just so you kind of cross reference it with like how sophisticated you know the company is. So you know, with some of the very large banks that that I work with, I know they're they're doing perimeter scanning and stuff on a regular basis. So if I find something that's like too good to be true, then then it's yeah, probably a honey. Yeah. 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 So yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, and in some cases like that, you can use uh, you know just stand up like a very basic pen test server that's not going to be tied back to your IPs or anything, and just test it really quickly from that, and then you know try to do a pivot attack, and uh, you know if it doesn't lead anywhere, then you, know, you can kind of just make the assumption. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. There's actually uh, a talkish move on from Rob Porter. So, like identifying honeypots and such? I mean, yeah, or not even just like honeypot systems, but kind of like canary honeypot accounts. So like yeah, like yeah, there's all, yeah, there's usually a lot of uh, too good to be true type scenarios, but I mean, none of them, none of them are still, they're usually tied back into some kind of uh, alerting or identification mechanism. Um, Sometimes a dead giveaway is good to print the uh, IP stack of it. It says it's a Windows box, and you start printing the IP stack, it comes back with the answer or something else. That yeah. It, it's like, like, yeah, but even even like accounts, uh, like easy accounts that are uh, that are able you're able to break into. It's um, you know most of those things are not again showstoppers in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they're just another obstacle, and those it's actually a way for you know the, the client or the organization to you know identify you. Or know you're there, uh, but even if they can identify you, it doesn't necessarily mean they can stop you. So you know, you just go find another way. Any other questions? All right, well, I will be uh, hanging around here today or tomorrow if uh, anyone wants to come up and. Uh,